planets. And first of all, was that beneficial? I mean, you guys, first of all, I hats off to everybody here that wants to sit through and listen to healthcare discussions <laughs> on a Wednesday evening. So uh, I really appreciate that. But for folks that have questions right now, if you're interested in following up on anything that was discussed um, during any of the presentations, please, uh, I, I also, by the way, I want to recognize one thing before we go on too far here. What we're doing is kicking off these town halls in a partnership with a couple other organizations. And one of those organizations is called the Michigan Chapter of the Free Market Medical Association. We have Dr. Ken Fisher setting that up here for us. Uh, Ken, can you stand up and say hi to everybody there? Thank you, sir. 
insurance, right? So they're not participating with the insurance companies. And you absolutely can see a direct primary care doctor with Medicare. Medicare just won't compensate for the membership. And I, I want to add, there is an organization, dpcare.org, has a, I think it's got a direct primary care doc finder on it, but not all the direct primary care docs know about it, so they're not in that directory, and it actually doesn't show up with a lot of them. But that is one place to actually go off and look that up right now. But this is all starting new. I mean, we just passed our law back in uh, 2014, so you're starting to see just a, a small expansion of this market because it, it takes a while. If you've been wrapped around a, a traditional practice for a while, there's very few early adopters here, like Dr. Tinbaum and Teresa. But uh, for the there's a, for the folks that um, are just kind of putting tippy toe in the water right now, there's not a lot right now. So what we're trying to do with these town halls is kind of prime the pump on interest for direct primary care docs as well, and letting doctors that have been pushed into the hospital-based systems to know that it's safe to come come into the water again and actually practice medicine the way that they want to. My name is Elaine, and um, I am uh, struggling with the concept of signing up for Medicare. Um, I'm against the uh, philosophy of it, and um, so my choice would be to be involved in something like uh, DPC, um, but I don't know the consequences of not signing up for Medicare. I think I can handle that one too, if you don't mind. Um, I really appreciate your thought. Sign up. And I'll tell you why. There's, I think, an unethical thing that occurred and was never actually written into either of the laws, where if you choose not to take Medicare at all, they actually hold your Social Security check. So I think that's very unethical, but that is the way it is. Now, the, the, um, the, um, uh, just to finish up a little bit more with Medicare, um, it's an interesting thing. The more you have control over which insurance product you choose, the much more cost-effective we are. Just like uh, Teresa was saying with, with the, you know, the self-funding options, or if you buy your own insurance, or if you buy your own self-sharing. The problem is once you get to Medicare age, you're kind of locked into at least traditional Medicare. Um, what, where you can save the money is potentially on the supplemental. MediShare, which is one of the Christian Healthcare Ministries, actually does have a supplemental option for seniors. Uh, and so there's an interesting paradox. We try to get you back to no additional cost by saving you money on all those other things and giving you better care, because then you got better care at no other, at no additional cost. Um, but the weird paradox is it's a little harder to save you money, but the more you need a doctor who can give you that attention. So the, the older you get, the less cost effective it may become, but the more you actually need it. So so, so the consequences, you would say, and, and for me, it's, it's more of an ethical thing than it is a medical thing. Sure. And, uh, so one of the consequences would be um, Social Security, um, paying for medicine out of my own pocket, anything else that you can see? I mean, is there, um, there is there is a, there is a, uh, another route where you could go, and that would be to just sign up for Part A, which is your hospital coverage, and just that that's not going to cost you anything. Part B is what costs you, and that's what you use for in your primary care and professional services. So just sign up for the Part A, then you met the requirement, and then do DPC for for the professional. One additional thing, just for I don't want you inadvertently harmed. Um, there, that I absolutely agree. The one thing to know is if you ever did change your mind and you wanted to go back to Part B, they have a 50% per year penalty that you didn't enroll in Part B. So they, they, they do that for the risk pool. They want to get all the 70, 65 year olds who aren't as high utilizers covering the 80 year olds, so they try to lock it. Thank you. Yes, sir, the longer you wait for the Part B, the more caution. Uh, Chip Cohoke, uh, I'm wondering if any of you have heard of uh, the Oklahoma Surgical Center, and I believe, believe what's interesting is, uh, you know, we talked about, we talked about the primary care and posting your prices, well, for major surgical procedures, they're posting prices, something unheard of in, in healthcare, and I, from what I understand, it was large employers that kind of drove the process, the hospitals weren't too eager, uh, and the end result is you've got um, brokers who are pulling people out of line in Canada and bringing them to the Oklahoma Surgical Center, and they're getting huge discounts over what you would pay, for example, in uh, you know in Boston, Massachusetts, for a similar 
or Detroit for a similar procedure. And I'm just curious if that's a movement that fits in with this. Absolutely. Now, obviously, we're just focused on the primary care connected with traditional insurance on it. But it's, when you get to deductibles that are sitting up around $10,000, right. then you're going to start looking for something that's I might be able to get a whole surgical procedure soup to nuts for less than ten thousand dollars, and I, I I can do it on my own. But I it's surgerycenterok.com for anybody that's out here, and I want to give hats off and kudos to Dr. Ken Fisher because I went to another care event back in Ann Arbor. Uh, what was that four years ago? Three? No oh, man, man, time. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, they talked about all kinds of, they had Dr. Smith, who actually heads up that surgery center in Oklahoma, as one of the speakers here. And literally 90% savings on some of the surgeries. And you go to their website, the first page is a human anatomy. You pick down a body part, talks about all the surgical procedures that can happen there. And it uh, uh, gives you a uh, <clears throat> uh, out the door pricing. So soup to nuts like uh, Chad was talking about in regards to a full wrap cost, turnkey costs on it. And by the way, there I have been in discussions with some people that are talking about setting that type of model up here in Michigan. So it's at the very early stage, but what it will start doing is driving down costs in all the other traditional hospitals here as well. How convenient. I actually have a slide that addresses this very topic. <laughs> this is from another presentation, but I brought it up. It shows kind of you extrapolated cash pay to the entire system. These are this combines our prices in the dark primary care model. There's a doctor, uh, a orthopedic spinal surgeon. His name is Dr. Stan Lee, not the inventor of Spider-Man. Uh, the uh, he uh, several years ago we met him at the other care conference that Senator Colbeck put together. By the way, I couldn't even do this without Senator Colbeck. Um, he helped pass that law that made it able for us to do this. I mean, I we owe him a lot in the DPC realm. But anyway, I met uh, Dr. Stanley, and at the time, he was telling me that he could do rat price surgery, spine surgery, right? You know, that's expensive stuff, a laminectomy. He could do it per level, pre-op surgery, anesthesia, post-op care for $8,000 a level. So I actually created a model here that shows up the a, a year and someone who comes in with back problems that goes through the entire escalation, MRIs, gets spinal injections, finally ends up getting surgery. And if they had done it through the traditional insurance route, the bill rate of that is over $100,000 and it's under $10,000, including MRI, spine injections, and spine surgery, under $10,000. And if you have an ERISA-based healthcare plan, you care what that whole cost is. So the person is very much incentivizing the business to look for these kind of options. They're somewhat scattered right now. The best center is Oklahoma Surgical Center, which is obviously in Oklahoma. But there are doctors, Dr. Matt McCord is working on trying to create something like that locally. And then Dr. Stanley is already doing that, at least for spinal surgery. And another example that we um, have a lot of home letters to take it out every year. Right? And um, we have a surgery center there in the front that at the normal cost of the hospital, the normal cost of the hospital is $22,000 for about five surgery and anesthesia and physician. And the uh, outpatient surgery department is $22,000. <coughs> Copay is really your cost when you do health insurance. So what's the one percent twenty two thousand? Essentially they can do the primary care for the same cost as patient copay. Now, doesn't that put in context Chad's slide at the beginning talking about the rising administrative costs that are going in there? So how do you get we've actually reached that kind of point where it's approached kind of ludicrous overhead of my hand, right? And and it's ready for a major disruptor in the healthcare market. That's what these free market cash only solutions actually offer. You know, um, you know, Keith Smith who came in as the keynote speaker. Yeah, come on up here. Good job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Talk about it. No, you can't. You can't do that from the back. We're just saying. Uh, yeah. One of the mics up here. You know, Keith Smith, who is uh, the founder of the Oklahoma Surgery Center with a uh, with a surgeon. He's an anesthesiologist. He came as the keynote speaker to our other care conference at his own dime. We didn't pay him a penny to come. And he really worked hard. But he is one of the founders of the Free Market Medical Association. And the yearly meeting in 
in Oklahoma City brings together all these people who are doing exactly what he's doing. And it's spreading all over the country. So if you want to learn how to do this, you go to that meeting, you talk to three, four, five people who are there, and you will learn how to set up your own surgical center that is cash-based. And believe it or not, they are extremely successful. Keith Smith, who, uh, who mortgaged everything he had to start this, is very proud to tell you that he is doing extremely well. Yeah, and that's a funny thing, too, because people go, oh, drug primary care, these cash be surgical. they, they got to be really taking it on the nose to do this. They don't. Keith Smith's approach is he actually went to the local surgeons. Why would they do surgery in the local hospitals and in his little surgical center? And what he did is he said, who's your best payer? And he said, from the shoulder or whatever. What do they pay it? And he goes, that's all I pay. So he gives them the same price or more than the best paying insurance. What that shows is how much is wasted on mumbo jumbo. You know, the fact that he can pay them, the surgeon does well, the patient does great. The only loss here is to the third party intermediaries. Now, hey, you know, we're talking a lot about insurance. We're talking about going around insurance. Uh, some of these prices here are, are still expensive for somebody. So if you actually go off and, uh, God forbid I get hit by a bus or whatever, and I'm in the hospital for a while, that's going to be expensive. And so some of these operations, well, I, I'm saving 90%, but if I still can't afford that 10%, that's still an issue. So there is a role for insurance. And back in the good old days, if you would, that was about risk management. That gets to what I was talking about before. Right now, insurance companies are trying to be healthcare management. That's why they need more and more of your information. That's why they, they're trying to, that's why you have a 150-90 organization between a doctor and a patient, because they're all regulating your health and making sure that you make good decisions that you're not able to make on your own. Um, instead, it gets to the, it, what really insurance is all about is what uh, Teresa was talking about with those stop loss or the reinsurance payments on it. It's a matter of limiting your liability so when you do get hit by a bus, or whatever the case may be, then you limit your out-of-pocket expenses to hopefully what you've got sitting in a savings account. And most of us don't necessarily have $10,000 or $90,000 sitting in a savings account. That's, what, that's the role that insurance plays. And uh, as long as we can start getting everybody starting to play their positions in healthcare, like let physicians manage the care along with the patients of their health and let the financial part being handled by insurance companies for when things go bump in the night, we'll be doing a lot better in our, in our health uh, care uh, industry here in the state of, in the state of Michigan and the nation as a whole. You have to be very careful. If people don't think I hate insurance, I, I do not hate insurance. I love insurance. It's necessary to prevent, it's a financial tool to prevent bankruptcy. That's what its essence is. It's corrupted into health maintenance organizations, so they actually control the provision of care. That's where the problem lies. Everybody should have some form of coverage or insurance. Well, this is a this is a great uh, forum. Uh, I'm Dr. Cal Dykstra, and uh, uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine is the is the uh, journal for the internists uh, in America. And uh, in the recent issue of the Annals of Internal Medicine, there's a letter to the editor regarding uh, an article that came out in December of uh, uh, 2015. And the article, uh, the topic of that article uh, was assessing the patient care implications of concierge and other direct patient contracting practices. A policy position paper from the American College of Physicians. Well, I thought that was very interesting. And uh, so I made a copy of the 18 pages and uh, read it, and uh, I was impressed that there wasn't anything really critical of this approach, and I liked it very much. But there was one paragraph I'll read you. The college supports physician and patient choice of practices that are accessible, viable, and ethical. It asserts that physicians in all types of practices must ensure that they are meeting their obligations to serve patients of all types, especially the poor and other vulnerable patients. ACP, American College of Physicians, recommends that direct patient care practices consider ways to mitigate any adverse impact on the poor and other undeserved populations. Now, 
with a program that you people are talking about, you're going to have the time and the opportunities to take care of poor patients because you know how to do it. And you can take care of them more easily than anybody that's in this kind of a, quote, establishment, quote, program. So I think it's, I think it's a real opportunity what you're talking about. And I think you can, you can take care of all kinds of people, people that can't pay, I mean, you can just take care of them. And if that isn't good enough for you, you can always go to the local hospital and work a half a day once in a while and take care of Medicaid patients. And I'd like to judge, say you have to bring that point, tie that into what they are already doing in the state of Washington around direct primary care. So they actually have gone off and implemented direct primary care for the Medicaid population there. And they, their savings, by the way, are, I, I, I've been conservative with my estimates of 20% savings. They approached the 50% threshold, and this is for um, low-income, disadvantaged people on Medicaid. And the thing that drove me up the wall in regards to um, the uh, discussion around Medicaid expansion and my provision of an alternative, alternative to it that was based on direct primary care was that we were actually going to be able to get the people that were low income better quality care and save the taxpayers money at the same time. And they didn't want to go off and, and support it. And I know Dr. Rusty uh, has been, uh, and Chidi has been, We've gone off and seen how this could actually benefit some of the folks that are in indigent care right now. And uh, I, uh, one of the things I like to talk about is that when you have a direct primary care agreement, you know, when Chad was talking about the different membership contracts that you have there, when you have a membership contract and we're paying for that, that particular care, uh, you don't have the scarlet M on your chest when you go into that doctor anymore. You're getting a dollar um, for of revenue for a dollar worth of treatment, and they are getting good care. Right now, under Medicaid, you're getting 40 cents, uh, 40 cents on the dollar uh, as a physician for it, and you don't get the good quality care, and you don't get the remuneration. So, it by definition, a lot of this direct primary care directly would help the poor. So, thank you, Dr. Lexer, for bringing that up. We have one last quick question that the question I would say is coming. The, uh, the, you know, it was one thing before I did direct primary care, I knew hypothetically it would help the poor. Now I have a year of experiential data. It is, that is our primary base right now. The people who primarily are coming to us, there's a gap. If you're super, super poor, you fall into Medicaid. If, you're, if you make a really good living, you probably can afford your own insurance, but there is a gap between the upper lower class and the lower middle class where they cannot or barely can afford their insurance and actually cannot afford their care. That is our biggest area of growth right now. We have people who are coming in, and we spend an hour and a half on their first visit because they haven't seen a doctor in years, and it's like an exhalation of relief that they can actually afford and access their care. And I will tell you, as a doctor, from a human aspect, that is wonderful. That is wonderful to be able to care for. I'm just going to make a few comments. I'm Dr. Rusty Shane. I'm in a private office in Ann Arbor called the Mayas Care and also at the University of Michigan. And I have comments about three things, if you don't mind. First was about the care for the, uh, for the underprivileged. There are a number of different models where that's been done. There's a model in Washington State through Q Lions. There's a gentleman in uh, California who started a model and a few others, one in Wisconsin and one in North Carolina, have, have reproduced where he has a kind of concierge or direct care model for beneficiaries, and he's able to provide care for the uninsured, because there still are a lot of migrant farmers and so forth who are uninsured. And he's the biggest provider of care for the uninsured outside of the health department in the entire county, and he's still able to do it because his, his direct care model is that efficient. Uh, <clears throat> there's some, and there are other models as well. So this is not exclusive. There's plenty of opportunities to provide uh, charity. Uh, the other one that uh, Senator Colbeck referred to is a company in Detroit, which is a for-profit company, and they are taking care of what's called dual eligibles. These are patients who have Medicare and Medicaid. Most people run away from this group because they're such a high-risk group. Their whole business model is built around managing this group of patients, and through a basically a direct care kind of model, which is really, it's also called capitation, <laughs> They're actually providing very high quality care and making money by doing this with this group of patients. So that was my first comment. Second had to do with 
the endorsement of medical associations. So in 2013, I was at the very first uh, National Direct Primary Care Conference, and I described my experience as being with the hippies, the libertarians, and the cowboys. And that basically is what it was. I mean, there were a couple of corporate interests there, but over the course of two years, it went from hippies, libertarians, and cowboys to organized medicine. So the outgoing president of the American Academy of Family Physicians was there. The sitting president of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine was there. Uh, program directors who run residencies were there. Department chairmen were there. So you are starting to see this go from, you know, onesie, twosie, mom, pop kind of organizations to where you're starting to see academic and organized medicine beginning to look at this, and this is beginning to take hold there as well. My third comment, and I'm really not a cynic by nature, though this comment may sound like it, but Senator Colbeck talked about the insurance companies uh, uh, you know, taking over here. One of the newest trends, which is frankly a support of direct primary care, really is what direct primary care is, is called population medicine, which means that you're responsible for a population of patients. Well, Dr. Savage would tell you that that's what he does in his practice. He's responsible for the population of patients enrolled there. Whether they come in or not, he may contact them and say, you need to come in. Well, insurance companies are doing that, and they also have something called value-based insurance, where they're reimbursing you based upon quality. The cynical part here is, I wish I could say that they're really worried about quality. Really, it comes down to cost. So we have this inflated bureaucracy, which has driven up the cost, which becomes an infinite loop of bureaucracy to create more of it to try to, to monitor this. And I think that is what's happening. And an example of that is I was talking with a person who runs a quality program, and he had this very intricate, very elaborate system for identifying patients for these quality program. And I said, well, why don't you just ask the doctors who have heart failure? And he said, well, we can't trust the doctors. And I said, well, so we get this right. You can't trust the doctors to tell you who has heart failure, but you're going to trust the doctors to take care of those patients and to know which medicines to give them? And he basically said, yeah, that's right. So I think we have this perverse bureaucracy that has is, that is grown up around quality as well, which is what gives me the cynicism to say it's really more about it's really more about managing costs that have been created by the insurance company and it really is about managing quality. Okay, those are my comments. Thank you. 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 Um, there's been uh, several articles written uh, to the point of just costs associated with uh, small businesses and saving money with self-funded insurance companies and direct primary care. And most of the self-funded companies that are in, um, uh, most of the businesses that are in self-funded insurance now are a lot of large state organizations also. And they're serving about 30% right out of the box doing the self-funding. And then you add on top of that direct primary care, sort of like a, a medical home environment where they are controlling the wellness of the entire employee population. And they're saving about another 25 to 27 percent. So every one of these businesses are saving money when they go with self-funded and direct primary care together. And any time somebody tells you that they're saving money, or any business is saving money to a PPO, an HMO, insurance, um, commercial insurance, they are not telling you the truth. All right, well, I don't see anybody else lined up at the mic here. And I just want to kind of wrap things up, if I might. And first of all, say thank you to everybody who came here today. We have people that have driven from all over the state to come here today. I hope you guys realize this. We have folks from Muskegon. We have folks from uh, out in the Grand Blank area. We've got folks from, uh, you know, out in the Livingston County area. Uh, we've got folks from down from Detroit. We've got folks from all over the place coming here to hear this. So uh, my call to everybody is to go off and be Johnny Appleseed out there with <laughs> the rest of the, the state because, uh, well, let me ask a question to everybody here. Do you, do you think this is a message that needs to get out to more and more people? Is that safe to say? Yeah, Ken, you're a good one. All right. <laughs> Do what we can to help out on that, okay? Because, yeah, go ahead, Elaine. <laughs> One more question. Don't you have 
salespeople for this type of thing? Well, right now, I'm operating as a salesperson. <laughs> so, for the state of Michigan. You are the salesperson. Yeah, this is our this kind of notional free market healthcare alliance between government and uh, service providers is what we're really trying, what we're kind of just uh, organizing to go off and promote. But we really want to take this everywhere around uh, the state because if we expand this footprint, all those cost savings that I was talking about with my final slide, where we talk about saving six billion dollars in the in the private sector, we start talking about saving hundreds of millions of dollars in in uh, our public sector, and we start talking about billions of dollars saved in Medicaid. None of those happen unless we have a robust network, a robust footprint of direct primary care service providers, and a robust network of TPAs or third-party administrators and underwriters, insurance providers, that can actually connect the dots with those uh, employers and with those service providers. So I, we're looking for some more evangelists out here. So our office is always there to serve. And um, go to morningmachine.com, you can stay in contact with us. And there's a lot of information outside that you can pick up around this, uh, around this topic. So there's some flyers in particular around this town hall. If you can kind of spread them around there without littering, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to uh, pull on this meeting any longer than it needs to be. But I think um, in terms of getting in contact with direct primary care physicians, for the, those practicing pure direct primary care, you're looking at it uh, right now, and for uh, you guys, I, I'm, to my knowledge, I'm the only pure DPC practice in Michigan. Yeah, Paul Thomas. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm Dr. Paul Thomas. I'm the one who's only need on social media. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm looking to launch a practice in Detroit and serve Wayne County, um, but I'm uh, essentially operating out of, out of a bed. But I need to find patients, and it's really difficult to find patients. So if you go to a website, it's called IWantDirectCare.com. You can put your name on the map and say that I want direct primary care. And that can communicate to um, doctors who are practicing or doctors who want to start a practice that there is demand in our communities for this type of service. That would help. And then if you're looking for doctors, there's dpcfrontier.com. And the green dots on the map are the pure direct primary care practices. The yellow are the hybrid. DPC insurance model practices. So I encourage you to check out both of those resources. Um, I guess for a plug for myself, my name is Paul Thomas. I'm starting Plum Health DPC in Detroit and Wayne County. So if you're interested in services on that side of the state, that's where I'm trying to set up. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Could you show one of your slides that shows the guy with the, that has an insurance plan? A person with a high deductible plan, that, but is also a direct primary sure. care member. I will so show, if I can find it. Um, well, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> All right, so thumbs up, everybody, for, for tonight. We're going to try to get these. Um, we've got... Dr. Uh, Thomas has been talking about getting something set up in Detroit. We're actually looking at setting something up in Flint uh, as well coming up here. And, um, and there's also discussion about having something out in, in the Brighton area as well coming up. So just uh, do what you can, get out on social media blast today. This is something that we'll, we'll get the actual video from the event out there so you guys can share it with people and put it in context. But um, uh, anything you can do to help us evangelize would be appreciated. And no one needs to stay for this, so if you got to go, thank you very much, appreciate it. Anybody wants to see? So I did, this is a long lecture. Anybody wants to come out? We're doing these all the time out in Brighton. I'd love to have you out. We're more complex, we get nuts and bolts. But to explain this in detail, or quickly, this is a gentleman uh, who, who has a very bad hair. He uses a doctor a lot. What this shows right here, this is premium cost. That's what you pay on your insurance. This little bit up here is what you pay on top of the insurance. So this gentleman in a bad year, he spends over $14,000 on his insurance product alone before he's ever seen the doctor. 
he bought this plan so the thought that when he used his, his medical care and he needed it in a bad year, he could save a lot. But at a 10% co-insurance, he's still paying $540 on top of this massive mountain of premium. If he switched to a traditional bronze plan, which has a high deductible, the premium is so much less that he still saves money. However, he gets terrible prices. The, price, the services that he gets, he's getting ridiculous prices. The prices are wrong in the entire system. People see our prices, they think they're a scam. And I tell them, no, no, these are not the scam. These are the true prices. The current system prices are scams. But this is what happens when he uses a direct approach. So he gets a, so if he combines these two, gets the inexpensive bronze plan, and uses a direct approach, he only adds $800 onto this much lower premium. And this is what happens when he goes to Christian-based health sharing and adds on those costs. He ends up saving $11,500 that year. And this is a diabetic patient who has two sick visits. That's not uncommon for a diabetic. This is a, this is a significant case, but this is not an unusual case. And it used to be said that the most expensive thing you can purchase in your life is your house. That is now longer, no longer true. It is your health insurance. So take a couple minutes Look at your plan. You will save so much money by making a wise choice. Thank you.